Good afternoon and welcome to the What to Think About Before You Plant webinar on large and commercial markets brought to you by the University of Kentucky Center for Crop Diversification. The Center for Crop Diversification has developed a new publication, What to Think About Before You Plant. This webinar will focus on what you should consider if you're thinking about moving beyond direct-to-consumer marketing and selling your products to restaurants, grocery stores, institutions, wholesalers, brokers, or processors. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A panel and we'll pass them along to our speakers. Our speakers today are Brett Wolf, who aggregates farmers market price reports for Kentucky and manages the center's website and Facebook page. He hopes to strengthen regional ties and continue building timely and useful resources for growers and extension professionals in the region. He has recent specialty crop production experience after working for three years growing vegetables for field and high tunnel research at the University of Kentucky Horticulture Research Farm. Our second speaker today will be John Hendrickson, who is the program manager for fresh market vegetables and food systems at the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He coordinates research and training programs in organic and sustainable specialty crop production, marketing, and profitability. He helped develop Veggie Compass, a tool to help diversified vegetable growers measure profitability by crop and market channel. John also operates his own small-scale vegetable farm and sells primarily to wholesale markets. Uh, before we begin today, in addition to thanking John for joining us, uh, we really appreciate him being here today. Uh, we'd also like to thank the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service and the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program for helping fund the What to Think About Before You Plant publication and webinar series, as well as additional activities of the Center for Crop Diversification. And with that, I'll turn things over to Brett. Thanks, Christy. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, if you could, just drop a note in the chat bubble, letting us know that you can hear everything, that the sound's coming through okay, uh, and we'll just make sure that we uh, that you can hear us, because if we talked for, for the next hour without anyone hearing us, that would be no good at all. All right. Great. Um, so I'm just going to talk, just to give you an idea, I'm going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes about <clears throat> some of these, uh, this, the elements of this publication, what to think about before you plant, as well as a few other resources available from the Center for Crop Diversification uh, and the University of Kentucky. And then the bulk of the time, we want to hear from John, who has a, a lot of experience and expertise in this area, and uh, ask him questions. Again, using that Q&A, it's just, it's in the bubbles just down from the, uh, from the, the chat bubble you just used. If you have any questions, enter in there in the Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. This idea, the, the main focus here is thinking about what the market channel is that you're trying to access, and then uh, what are some of the major considerations ahead of doing that? That's the basic takeaway. We had a presentation uh, last week about direct markets. If you're interested in that, it's available on the CCD website. Uh, and this, year, this week we're talking about thinking about growing into these larger and uh, different commercial markets. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. Starting off with a little bit of context and some data from Kentucky. This, what this shows is our producers, the number of our producers or the percentage of our producers who are selling more than 10% into a given channel. And a couple of things you'll see here uh, from 2009 to 2012, the number of folks who were selling a large volume, more than 10%, into farmers markets went down, while some of these other outlets like Direct to Grocery, Farm to School actually increased. The main takeaway point here is that <clears throat> this interest and effort around local food is not limited to that direct market space. There are these other opportunities that we're going to be talking about more over the next hour. This was a survey of growers in Kentucky, and you can see overall people were fairly positive about the uh, potential for future growth in different markets, uh, but particularly in things like restaurants, as well as these, these wholesale market channels, auctions. This is where people, producers, thought they saw the most growth potential for them in the next, uh, next five-year window of time. 
again, just saying it one more time, spreading this local demand out across markets. It's no longer just a direct, direct marketing channel interest in these types of uh, products. You're seeing interest in all of these larger commercial markets as well. That's our focus here today. I want to mention these KDA programs. If you're not, if you're selling in Kentucky and you're not a member of the Kentucky Proud program, it qualifies you for some grant and marketing opportunities. It's, it can be a great marketing tool and logo for you. It has a lot of brand recognition throughout the state and even throughout the region. And you can contact the folks at KDA. It's, uh, as far as joining, it's, it's free to join. And then some of the secondary, um, you can, you get certain things at cost. You can buy marketing materials like bags or stickers or that kind of thing. Banners use the logo, but it's a great program. And I think it's, uh, one of the better ones in the region as far as branding a, <clears throat> a state product. So what we have at the CCD have to offer in spades are resources, uh, things like publications. We mentioned here this first publication is the primer that I'm going to talk about in a second. We also have the crop profiles, which are typically three to six page publications that highlight the production and marketing considerations for a given crop. And we have these and everything from asparagus to zucchini. And it just gives an introduction or an overview so that you can evaluate whether a crop might be a good idea for you. And it, there, are, there is a particular emphasis in some of these profiles on these commercial markets and the broader commercial viability of it. The CCD budgets are another thing. We're actually going to be updating those this year, but they're only four years old now. Uh, they can help you to assess, I'll talk about the, them in a second, they can help you to assess the potential cost of production or estimate the cost of production. This last one, number four, unfortunately we can't help you with that at the CCD, but a great resource before you start planting, before you even start the planning, before the planting, are your marketing partners, the folks who you're interested in selling to, um, uh, also people who have sold into these kind of markets that you're trying, your, the, your peer group, your other co uh, fellow farmers. Talking to them, asking lots of questions about packaging and quality and the types of products, that can be probably the biggest resource that you can, that you can access. So this Primer publication I mentioned, it's available, there's a link there, but the easiest way to do it is just go to the, the Center for Crop Diversification website, there's uky.edu slash ccd, and just search Primer. It'll come up, you'll be able to follow the link to the PDF, but like so many things in this world, it's an acronym. Um, and it, it's essentially a series of, of worksheets where you answer some questions and then it spits out like a personality test almost. It spits out some numbers that you can then use to evaluate that uh, a given enterprise for your business. And it starts out assessing the potential profitability of that enterprise. Uh, it helps you to assess the resources that you have. Now, in this case, resources refers to things like your equipment and skill and expertise, your capital, those kinds of uh, resources. The next one is information, which is, I just mentioned the CCD, I mentioned KDA, there's a number of others, KCARD, Community Farm Alliance, a number of people uh, who are out there who can help provide information and uh, if you don't have good information, a good basis of information for the enterprise you're thinking about pursuing, you may end up doing some uh, inadvertent research of your own and come to some hard conclusions about the viability of it. Marketing, is there a market for what you're doing or could you, would you be able to potentially foster one or create one? What is your enthusiasm for the crop? What is, are you excited about it or is it just something that you think you might be able to make money on? Um, I think a lot of folks who get involved in this farming world do so because they're enthusiastic and they're excited and they're, they're they love what they do and so if it's something that you aren't going to love what you do is that going to be a good option for you and this last one risk uh, we've done a number of we did a webinar recently on <clears throat> some risk management and uh, risk assessment this one here is uh, it's multifaceted but there again in the primer you can click through and, and answer the questions and, and see what you it's a tool to help you evaluate I mentioned the budgets. These are Excel spreadsheets available on our website. You just go to the website and search budgets. It'll take you right to it. Um, it can help assess these types of costs, uh, the ones that are associated with packing and grading, on-farm storage, et cetera. 
Um, if you're not aware, and you're, if you're a producer and you're not aware, we do have a number of demonstration farms as well as demonstration plots and on-farm field days throughout the state. We're going to do, try to do a better job this year of uh, advertising those and letting people know about when they are and where they are so you can get out and see. Again, this is that information side of the primer. Uh, this is a table from the publication, What to Think About Before You Plant. It's, uh, it goes step by step here comparing different market channels across different variables. Um, for instance, in the farmer's market, you're probably going to have to have a wide variety of products, a wide, a broad mix of products as compared to a wholesaler may want a specific one or two things. And talking with that buyer is, is the best way to figure that out. Uh, there's differences, obviously, in packaging and standardization, as well as this grading and quality assurance. I'm not going to go through this. I just want you to see this is the kind of stuff that's in that publication, what to think about before you plan. This is something we've seen growth and seen people interested in over the last uh, few years. You can find out more information about the KDA Restaurant Rewards Program through the Kentucky Department of Ag, but um, what we see typically is a blend of people taking some stuff directly from producers, direct delivery, uh, as well as still buying from the distributors that they're, that they're familiar with. And on that topic, this concept of direct delivery it can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we have here that chefs get excited. They really like the idea of having this delivered directly because in their mind, it doesn't get any fresher than it comes off your farm, into your truck, into their kitchen directly. Uh, but consistency is going to be crucial. It's, it's important in a lot of markets, but a chef knowing that they can depend on you to, be to, to deliver when you say you will, the quality and quantity that you said you could. Um, <clears throat> now, the flip side of that is delivering, if you have multiple drop-offs, delivering to that many different places can end up being a challenge. And so that you might take a look and see if a distributor might be an option for you at that point. But um, <clears throat> again, I'm trying to leave, I want to leave as much time for John to talk to us as possible because he has experience with this. Um, this is just, a, it was a survey of food co-ops across the country asking them about their local sourcing and whether it's increased or decreased, and most of them had indicated a, a some degree of increase. This is an example in the retail space of, of branding local while still, again, accessing this retail space. This super local farm estate was a term that Tim had suggested for this. Um, the idea that it's from five miles away that has some, in that, in that space, I think this is, a, yeah, this is a co-op. Uh, it has some cachet with their customers. So, Produce auctions, another example of a market channel that some people try to get into when they get to this scale. Uh, we have seen incredible growth over the last eight to 10 years in the number of vendors who sell there. Um, it's across the region, really. There's not, it's not just in Kentucky. But what we used to see was that it was mostly folks who would come and buy, you know, several boxes of tomatoes and then take it and resell it at a farm stand or somewhere else. As the growth, with the growth that we've seen in these auctions are starting to take more notice that the larger buyers are starting to take more notice and use this to access a local product uh, that's in the standardized packaging, has some food safety chops about it. Um, and as part of that, we have tried our best through the center to help share some of the pricing data. This is all available through our website, again, www.uky.edu slash ccd, if you're not familiar. Uh, we post these prices multiple times per week throughout the year, uh, throughout the season. But the idea is this is becoming a larger and larger segment of our produce world, our kind of produce wholesale, larger scale market channels. And so we want to help both buyers and sellers to be aware of the price environment. But selling at, farm, at produce auctions has its own considerations. Uh, the best way to get the actual considerations from is, is to, for each market is to talk to the manager managers at those markets. But traceability and vendor identification has become an important thing where we can tell which product came from where. Packaging, standardization of packaging, some of them, some of the market, most of these auctions are they require standardized packaging. And food safety, this has been a story across a number of different segments of the market, but knowing 
that the food is safe. We're doing the best that you can to assure food safety has become, a, it's always been a priority, these markets, these auctions, but it has grown even more so over the past few years. Again, thinking about delivery, this is just a, a thing to consider as you're weighing these larger markets. If you're talking about dealing with a distributor, what they do is distribute. They reach a wide variety of clients. Uh, at the same time, what they're doing comes with a cost. And knowing what your costs are and knowing where your profitability requirements fall is going to be the only way that you can assess whether or not distri distribution and as outsourcing of delivery is going to be a good idea for you. Again, I've already covered this a little bit. Uh, delivering direct to the store can have benefits and drawbacks as can selling to a wholesaler or an aggregator. Uh, if you have things dialed in and you understand that it's going to cost you a dollar a box to deliver something and the wholesaler is going to effectively charge 75 cents per box, maybe you can make that work. It's just, but again, and I, I think John has done a lot. I know he has done a lot of work in helping folks to understand what their costs are uh, what profitability means, what the hidden costs in some of the direct markets are that people don't think about. Um, but just being honest with yourself about what you what you can accept and what you can as far as price and, and uh, costs. You can see some of these big, big warehouses. You don't have to fill the whole warehouse yourself, um, but as you grow, it might be an option to think about. This is my last slide here. So uh, John, if you wanna get your PowerPoint queued up and ready to roll, I'm going to shift over to you, but this is the last, our, the last slide that I have, and that's basic questions to ask from your buyers. And this actually applies, I think, also to some of the direct marketing spaces where you can talk to a farmer's market manager and ask, what, what do you need in your market? Do you, we have a bunch of people who grow tomatoes, and that, that's great, but we really need carrots. Or if you talk to a wholesale buyer, and you do great purple carrots, but they tell you, actually, we need just kind of orange carrots that people are going to be familiar with. Asking buyers or whoever it is what products that they want puts you in a really good position later on because when you're talking about price, when you're talking about volumes, you have delivered them something that they want. You've made yourself a, a, a hot commodity for them. Uh, going along with that, how should it be packaged and delivered? If this is your first time getting into these kinds of markets, you'll notice the standardization is fairly fixed. Um, I don't know why it's fixed at sometimes a bushel and a ninth or some other strange, uh, strange size, but it is fixed and it's standard. And, uh, but that information is all available. This isn't some, I've talked about this before, but it's not some secret information that's hidden away somewhere. If you talk to folks, generally they'll, They'll share that kind of information. Uh, thinking about when they want stuff. Is there a certain time of year when they have way too much of it, more than they need? You know, we had in, in July, we have tons of tomatoes, but for some reason, our producers all drop off and stop producing after September. And we really, really, really would love to cover that Labor Day through Thanksgiving market window and maybe a high tunnel or something like that would be an option. But um, when and what they want, asking them is really the best way to get there. Uh, minimum volumes, in the same way that it may not make sense for you to drop three pounds of tomatoes at a dozen different restaurants because of the gas money, it may also not make sense for them to send a truck out for 25 pounds of tomatoes once a week. Uh, some companies will have minimum volumes, but again, that's something that you can ask a buyer. How to, Pricing, I think, is some, one of the more uncomfortable things for some people. Uh, part of that comes from maybe a personality thing, but part of it also comes from not being very comfortable with what your costs are. If you know how much something costs you, then you're in a much better position to explain your case for why you need to get a certain price out of it. This last question, insurance requirements, and I would add to that food safety requirements. Uh, do I, what kind of policies do I need to have for liability? What kind of concerns do I have in that regard? Do I need to be third party gap audited? Uh, is there any other additional things that I need to complete in order to sell to you? But these are just simple questions that you can ask regard, again, even some farmer's markets require you to have a certain level of food safety training, or they require a, maybe, a, maybe you have a small uh, liability insurance policy. But uh, with that, I just want to turn it over to John. A rem reminder, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in that Q&A section of the, uh, of the menu. 
And we're going to turn it over here to John Hendrickson. So I'm going to stop sharing my video. And I'm going to mute myself, I believe. John, are you muted? I hadn't said anything yet. I was waiting for you to fully turn it over to me. Can you hear me now? Can you hear him, Christy? Hello? Okay, we can hear you now. Great. <clears throat> I was waiting for you to fully throw things over to me before uh, unmuting, my, gotcha. unmuting my mic here. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for having me and inviting me to join you all on this topic. Can you, can you share your screen, John? I believe I, I thought I had. Let me try. You're not seeing it, right, Chris? No. Oh. All right, we're seeing it now. Okay. Thought I had done that before, but maybe I pressed the wrong button. Perfect. All right, so um, thanks again for and for inviting me to be with you today. So I work at a sustainable ag research and outreach unit at the University of Wisconsin. And then I also have my own small farm. You see the logo there, Stone Circle Farm. Uh, we are quite a unique operation in that we uh, are quite small, but we have primarily sold wholesale basically from the start of our farm operation. Uh, and I can talk about why that is as we go through some slides here. So um, I'm an educator and researcher at the university. It's a nine month, 75% appointment. And then that leaves me a little sliver of my life to try to run my farm, which we bought in 1999. We've had as many as three acres in vegetables, but currently have <clears throat> two acres in cultivation and really only about one acre in vegetables in a given year. Uh, we have always sold primarily to wholesale markets. We started out that way. We started out by selling through a farmer-owned marketing co-op called Homegrown Wisconsin. Uh, I was a part of that co-op for many years. It no longer exists, unfortunately. The, the, the long and short of that is that the co-op did a great job selling products for the individual farm members that were a part of that co-op and helped those farms increase sales and become more profitable. But the co-op itself had a hard time being financially sustainable in that middle area of the food system where, uh, where it can be difficult to operate. Uh, there was also some, some mismanagement, unfortunately, that happened, um, which brought about its demise in the end. We are currently focusing on three crops for primarily wholesale markets. Those are garlic, carrots, and hot peppers, which is a really odd combination of crops. If I, when I started my farm, if you told me that um, this many years into it that I would be focusing on those three, I would have told you that you were crazy. Uh, we grow... Uh, about seven, 8,000 heads of garlic on an annual basis, and we sell those wholesale to another farm. Uh, that farm is a CSA farm that delivers weekly boxes to their members, and they have decided to buy in a couple products. They buy in potatoes, and they buy in garlic from me. I uh, fell into a, a, situa a relationship with a processor, and I grow an heirloom hot pepper called the Beaver Dam Pepper, named after Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, um, which is processed or has been processed into a, a bunch of different products over the years. Um, unfortunately, that processor is going out of business, so I'm having to find something new to do with my peppers, and I'm currently working on selling hot peppers into the Chicago restaurant market. Um, Chicago is about two, three hours away from my farm. I do not drive to Chicago. I do not produce enough to, uh, to warrant a drive down to Chicago. But by working with some distributors, I can access those, those markets, which um, the prices that you can get for products in Chicago are much higher than in my local area. And then I grow a number of root crops, uh, mostly carrots, but also a few other things that I sell through the wintertime. Um, both to uh, wholesale markets, uh, and that is the one crop that we do do some direct marketing to. We do workplace deliveries. We have an online order form, uh, and people at the University of Wisconsin, and then at my, my wife is a school teacher, and we get orders from 
colleagues and parents at um, at the schools and deliver to those workplaces. And we've kind of been trying to work towards having year-round sales. That was a bigger emphasis when we were doing um, a lot more different crops than we are right now. Um, actually, right now we have months in the summertime where we don't really have sales. Um, and then we have sales in the fall and wintertime with the garlic uh, and the carrots. So this is a little bit about my farm. Um, there's a picture of the beaver dam pepper hot sauce that was um, marketed in Whole Foods stores for a while. Unfortunately, that's um, an endangered species right now. And I, um, I'm sad to see that product go away. It was a great marketing opportunity for me. So why wholesale, uh, especially why wholesale at a small scale? And, you know, typically if you start talking about wholesale, you hear people say, well, isn't, you know, isn't direct marketing the key to profitability if you're a small scale farm? And why would I sell at wholesale prices when I can get a retail, a direct to consumer price at the farmer's market or from CSA members or fill in the blank, you pick, what have you. And isn't wholesaling only for big farms? Don't I have to be a big farm producing in large volumes to access wholesale markets? Um, I am I am proof that that doesn't have to be the tr have, have to be true. And you know, isn't wholesaling going to require just a whole other layer of infrastructure and deal with more rules and regulations, grading standards, packaging standards, food safety regulations, um, those types of things? And some of that is definitely true. So there are um, as um, as was said previously, there are pros and cons to any type of marketing activity or marketing channel that you might pick. So direct marketing really has for a long time been promoted as the best. Um, and some, I feel like I've heard some people say it's really the only way for a small farm to market and sell their produce and be profitable. The reality is that um, those direct markets do um, provide you with higher dollar sales. Um, allows you to receive 100% of the consumer food dollar when you make those sales. And because you're selling direct to your end consumer, you've got opportunities for direct communication with the people that are eating your, your products. So direct feedback from the farmer and the consumer. What's, what do they want? Quality, taste, you name it. Some things that, um, that are also realities, which I don't think have received enough attention, is that when you try to cut out the middleman, that brings additional roles, responsibilities, and costs for you as the farmer. And I put cutting out the middleman, and you know, that phrase middleman, it's uh, uh, probably should say middle person, um, usually hear middleman, there's really no such thing as cutting out the middle person. There's really only becoming the middle person because if you are going to sell direct, um, you need to take on the roles of distribution and marketing and sales that someone else would do for you if you were selling wholesale. For example, if you decide to sell at a farmer's market, you in essence are setting up a retail store every time you go to the farmer's market. And you need to have your awning and your scale and your money box and signage and uh, perhaps some insurance. Um, you need to pay a market stall fee, those types of things. So there are costs of having that retail store. And you need to think about that when you think about whether that's the most profitable way to sell your products. Unfortunately, a lot of farmers, I believe, confuse sales with profitability. And so if, if, they're able to sell at a higher price. They feel like they're automatically being more profitable, and that's not necessarily true. So why would you consider wholesale? Well, lots of different reasons. Here's, a, here's four. Um, perhaps your local direct markets are too limited. Uh, maybe you live in a rural area, and your local farmer's market is pretty small, and you just don't get the traffic. You just don't get the sales. And so in order to become a more viable business, you need to sell more. And in order to sell more, you may have to act, go a little bit further. Uh, and you may need to think about other types of marketing channels. Uh, for some people, it may just be that your personality and skills are better suited to selling wholesale. Um, you know, maybe you don't like interacting face to face with customers at a farmer's market or doing CSA deliveries. Uh, and maybe if by, you know, by selling wholesale and growing a larger volume of crops, maybe this can uh, allow you to invest in some equipment and tools 
Um, many small scale farms doing uh, fruits and vegetables are highly, highly diversified, growing many, many different crops. And if you're growing small amounts of a lot of things, oftentimes you can't afford to buy a piece of equipment that might make the work uh, a lot easier and more efficient and more profitable. Um, things like a potato digger or uh, an undercutter for, for root crops, or uh, you know, maybe it's a, a, a bunch washer to wash bunches of beets and carrots. Um, that you could invest in if you um, if you scaled up that type of a, a crop enterprise. And finally, um, <clears throat> maybe you can access some wholesale markets where you, you can get a decent price point. And in some wholesale markets, there may be less risk. I know every person that sells at a farmer's market laments the rainy Saturday where they spent all week getting crops ready uh, and and spend a lot of time driving to the market and setting up the market stand and then it rains and people don't show up to buy. So those are just some reasons. Um, there are others as well. So <clears throat> this is uh, some imagery borrowed from Richard Wiswall, who has a book um, called uh, The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook, which is an excellent book that I highly recommend. Um, so he talks about um, he, he has this in the front of one of his, his chapters where, you know, that we all know this, that if we, we have our sales and then we subtract our expenses and then what's left is profit. And what the different font sizes here are meant to suggest is that there are different ways to come up with, um, an equivalent amount of profit. If our sales are the same as our expenses, we of course, we of course have no profit. If we're able to have a little bit more sales and keep our expenses the same, then we've got a little bit of profit. If we can really boost sales and keep our expenses the same, then we've got even more profit. But we could also achieve that same level of profit by not having to sell quite as much, but reducing our expenses. And then, of course, you know, the holy grail is being able to really boost sales and being able to keep expenses low and having a whole lot of profit. So going back to that first example, you know, <clears throat> maybe we can reduce our expenses um, and have, have some profit even at that same sales level. So what I want to do next is just give an example of expenses in a direct market situation. And of course, the most common thing that most people are doing is a farmer's market. So what are our costs if we're selling at a farmer's market? Well, we've got ourselves, if we're going to the market, or maybe it's an employee, a lot of the markets are, not, maybe I shouldn't say a lot of, but there are um, a number of markets in, in the Wisconsin area. I don't know if the same is true in Kentucky, where the market rules actually require uh, an owner to be present at the market. So you've got yourself, and your time is worth something. You you know, hopefully it's a busy market, and so you have uh, have to have an employee to keep up with with sales and handling customers and customer questions. Um, you've got to pay the market manager your stall fee. Um, you've got fuel to drive your truck to the farmer's market. And then you've got all the, the gear required to sell at a farmer's market, the awning, the scale, the signage, tablecloths, baskets, bins, um, any number of things that you uh, might need um, to sell at a farmer's market. And those things have costs and, you know, get beat up over time and might need to be replaced. So you need to account for that in an honest cost assessment of selling at a farmer's market. So, you know, these are just some numbers just to throw some numbers up. Um, so your cost of selling a per day at a farmer's market could be $400. Let's just take this as an example. Now, that doesn't include any overhead costs that you have for your farm business, the production costs of growing the crops. This is just of going to the farmer's market. So these charts down below, you know, say, say your costs are $400 per market. If, if you sell $400, then you've basically just broken even that day. If you were only able to sell $300 at the market, you lost money going to the farmer's market. This is, again, assuming that these numbers are real for your farm, that you've got $400 in cost. Sell $800, you've got a 50% cost relative to sales. Now, I want to just draw your attention to this um, 
level at, at two thousand dollars in sales your costs are only twenty percent of your sales and I just put that a circle around that because we're going to come back to those numbers on a future slide so most people that sell at a farmers market know some basic things about selling at a farmers market and one of the basic things is that if you want to sell two thousand dollars worth of stuff at a farmers market you probably need to take more than two thousand dollars worth of goods because these radishes are really easy to sell when they're in a nice big pile and as you get down to the end of the market those last few bunches of radishes are really hard to sell so you're going to need more product than what your sales goal might be so this is just a chart showing you that you know maybe if you want to have two thousand dollars in sales maybe you need to bring two thousand two hundred fifty dollars worth of product and then you've got a cost associated with that of you know harvesting that crop and all the labor that went into that that's uncaptured by your sales and as a percent here in this example we've got you know a four percent waste factor of selling at the farmers market and then you know maybe you need to bring even more product at the farmers market to the farmers market to in order to achieve that two thousand dollars worth of sales so we add in this layer of of this waste factor the four eight eleven or fifteen percent depending on how much product you bring now we're going to bring back that that twenty percent um, down here so this is our um, selling two thousand dollars worth of product uh, in, in our example, our, our, our expenses, which were $400, were 20% of sales. Well, if we sold everything, we had 0% waste factor. And so our total cost of sales was just that 20%. So if we have things that we sell at the farmer's market for $2, our profit is $1.60 because we've got that 20% going to pay our employee at the market, our stall fee, those types of things. But so now we'll just build in some of that waste factor. You know, maybe we need to bring um, more product in and we have a 4% waste factor. Well, now our total cost of sales is 24%. And now we're looking at a profit of $1.52. So when we sell something for $2, we're not, you know, taking home $2. We're taking home $1.52. So as you see, you know, these numbers doesn't take them long. Um, you know, your costs for going to the market may be even higher than that $400. And your waste factor on a given market may be relatively high, especially if it rains. So selling at a farmer's market, you really need to think through these things. And I would encourage anyone selling at a farmer's market to really know your costs to go to the market. Um, know whether it's for that, you know, that our example was $400. Every grower that sells at a farmer's market should know their absolute costs of, of going to the market so they can evaluate, you know, if sales are only a little bit more than our costs maybe that's a market channel that we may need to think seriously about abandoning or trying to find a way to make it work better for us that's that's farmers market uh, if you're doing a community supported agriculture program you've got specific costs that would be associated with doing a CSA uh, you, you might have a website for your CSA and maybe the only reason you have a, a website for your farm is because you're doing a CSA uh, you're printing CSA brochures uh, you might be doing some unique CSA advertising. Um, it takes management time to do, to do a CSA. Um, you've got lots of transaction costs with a CSA. Um, you might have specific boxes and bags that you use um, for selling through the CSA. And this is not to just, you know, pick on direct markets. Uh, we can go through wholesale markets and also talk about specific costs that they have as well. Um, this is just merely to point out that Simply sell, you know, deciding that direct markets are the most profitable because you get the highest price is not a very sophisticated way of looking at markets and profitability. So when does wholesaling make sense? Well, the important thing is to not jump to conclusions about the profitability of different markets. In the absence of information, we can jump to the worst conclusions. The answer requires taking a really close look at your complete costs, especially marketing costs. And a lot of people just, you know, especially in enterprise budgets, a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about the cost of seed and fertilizer and things like that, but they don't spend much time thinking about the marketing costs. And uh, those can be significant. Wholesaling does require a measure of scale, although there are exceptions to that, and my farm is one. Um, 
you also have to have a certain capacity and business professionalism, I think, in order to plan for and deliver to potential wholesale buyers. So let's just walk through a few wholesaling options. And I like to think about um, two levels of wholesale. There's wholesale and then there's direct wholesale. Wholesale is when you are selling to a distributor and then that distributor is then selling to someone else. Direct wholesale is when you yourself are reaching out to buyers like restaurants or retail stores or schools or as I do to other farms um, and then they're selling directly to the consumer. And in the other distrib you know, distributor wholesale level, there's a whole other layer before it gets to the final end consumer. Direct wholesale markets typically have a much uh, better price than the distributor wholesale prices. And so this can be a great first uh, avenue into doing wholesale, is doing direct wholesale. Although there are costs associated with doing direct wholesale that you don't have when you're doing distributor wholesale. Um, so then, yeah, the wholesale through a conventional distributor is the second type. And then there's a whole other kind of new age dis distributor model that's popping up in various parts of the country. And uh, there's a big wave of movement right now to create food hubs, uh, marketing co-ops, like the one that I was involved with. Uh, there's the home delivery services that are, that are popular right now, Blue Apron and whatnot, which is a whole other kind of, of, of entity to sell to rather than a conventional distributor that puts things on a, on a semi and takes it to a big city and, and whatnot. And then there, of course, is wholesale to a processor as, uh, as well, which is a little bit more unique and may not be uh, as widely accessible. But uh, as we, as the whole new uh, local foods movement broadens, there are increasingly opportunities uh, to sell to processors as well, because it's not just about fresh fruits and vegetables, but it's about tomato sauce and salsa and Bloody Mary mix and all kinds of different things that you can get involved in. So if you're interested in selling to retail stores, uh, it's really a good idea, and we're almost getting to be, to be really too late right now, but you really want to go and talk to those types of buyers in the wintertime. Find out where you might fit in. Uh, are there products that they're looking for? Are there products where there's gaps in terms of local supply? Um, they can give you feedback on, uh, on what you're gonna need to do in terms of packaging. Uh, they'll give you you know, an idea of what kind of price they're willing to accept. And you really have to do your homework. You've got to visit stores. Uh, I encourage people to visit stores throughout the year. Look at the displays. Look at what the product looks like. Look at the pricing. And when you're looking at the pricing, um, you know, that's, it varies from store to store, but it's not too hard to back off that price that you see in the, uh, in the produce aisle and think about what the farmer might be getting. It might be, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70% of the purchase price is what the farmer's actually getting. So, you know, a $2.50 bunch of beets in the store, um, the farmer's getting $1.40, $1.50 for, per bunch, perhaps. When you meet with a buyer, um, bring in a list of what you grow, what you grow well, especially uh, when it's going to be available, a price list. Um, and to really get a premium in this type of market, organic certification is, uh, is frequently uh, a significant thing to think about. Uh, certainly many of the farms that I know that do uh, sales to retail stores, specialty shops, food cooperatives, those types of things are certified organic and so are able to get that price premium that we enjoy as certified organic growers of which I'm one. I don't know if I mentioned that at the beginning of the talk. Um, the great thing about selling to a local retail store is that if you develop a relationship with that buyer, it can be just as good and solid as a relationship uh, with a customer at a farmer's market or with a CSA member. They can be incredibly loyal uh, and helpful and patient. Now, the downside to that loyalty issue is that if a buyer already has a whole set of growers that are supplying them, it can be difficult to get your foot in the door um, because they're being loyal to those existing suppliers that they have. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep trying and go in and talk to them about uh, where you might fit in. Uh, and that can be someplace where doing your homework can really pay off. If you go 
to the store on a weekly basis. And, you know, a lot of these stores are putting signage up about where they're buying their product from. And so you know whether it's local or not. And so you can tell the, the buyer, hey, you know, listen, I saw that, you know, through these two months, you did not have a local supplier for parsley or scallions or leeks or whatever it, whatever it might be. And then you can point that out to them. They may not be aware of that because they're busy people. They're, you know, they're filling the shelves any way possible. And they may not be keeping a record necessarily of, of where that product is coming from. Uh, these buyers are really looking for reliability and consistency. You've got to, you know, if you tell them that you can produce 12 cases of lettuce every week from this point of the year to this point of the year, you need to follow through and do that. Um, and you need to know how to do that. Um, so if you tell them that you're going to have, you know, X number of heads of lettuce, you need to plan accordingly. There's just a little chart here. Uh, it's more intended for beginning growers to help people uh, with planning to fulfill a wholesale uh, contract. Twice a week delivery is pretty standard. If you're selling to a retail store, Tuesday, Friday is, is, is very common days for them to get product. Um, you got to be professional. Uh, it really does require work um, to do this direct wholesaling. You will often have to call and text and email and you know, prompt them to remember to order from you. It's not just a given to give them your availability list at the beginning of the year and then, and then ha assume that they're going to contact you. Uh, you have to contact them on a regular basis, set it up in your, in your calendar, and um, routinize it. Uh, you got to have good labeling if you're going to deliver to retail stores. Um, date, farm name, contact information is all generally required. Um, you may or may not need a refrigerated vehicle. Uh, if you're delivering in a relatively tight geography, you could probably get away, especially if you have a walk-in cooler. So you're putting the product in cool into a vehicle. You could probably get it around to, uh, to deliver without a refrigerated truck. Uh, obviously, as you scale up, a refrigerated truck becomes uh, a practical necessity. Um, USD grading standards can and cannot be important. Um, a lot of small stores and local food co-ops, I mean, they want the product to look a certain way and, and be consistent, but they're not necessarily mandating that all of their farms follow a really, you know, highly specific USDA grading standard. Now, that's different once you start selling into a, a whole to a wholesale distributor that's selling to more conventional grocery stores. Then you're looking at, at needing to follow those those more stringent requirements. And then one thing that's, of course, coming, um, coming upon us right now with the Food Safety Modernization Act is the um, increasing requirement to have some type of food safety for your farm. Um, I feel like I've um, belaboring this. This is just kind of a summary of pros and cons of selling to retail stores. I'm not going to go through these as uh, most of this I've already covered again. Uh, I assume that Brett and Christy are going to make my presentation available on their website after the fact. So if you um, want to read through these at a later date, you can do that. Selling to restaurants is something that I've done quite a lot of over the years. Uh, that was the primary market outlet for the marketing co-op that I was a part of, Homegrown Wisconsin. Uh, it was basically the reason that that co-op was brought into existence was to sell to upscale restaurants, first in Madison and then in the Chicago marketplace. I always found selling to restaurants to be a, a really gratifying experience. And, and part of that just has to do with 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 the chefs that you end up interacting with. And, you know, some of these chefs can have um, personalities and attitudes that are a little bit um, over the top and, and abrasive potentially. But many of them, there's just a kinship with, with, with people that just, they absolutely love food. Uh, and farmers usually just love food. And, you know, everybody tosses around that they love food, but farmers and, and, and chefs uh, take that love to a whole nother level. And so there's uh, and there's just a, there's a, you got the frenzy of the kitchen and the frenzy of the farm, and so you know, kitchen workers and farm workers share a lot of similarities in terms of what their days are like. Um, so, um, and I was just really appreciated what the chefs were doing with with the food that I provided to them. Um, you know, basically kind of creating works of art um, with the things that I was selling. Um, again, buyers can be uh, extremely loyal uh, if you find a good chef to work with. 
Um, most of the, the chefs that are buying tend to be more upscale. This is not always the case. We've got a growing number of, of you know, more mid-range restaurants that are uh, falling in with this uh, the, local, the local food movement that we are, it's just been so amazing to see it develop over the years. Uh, if you're going to sell to chefs, it does pay to pay, pay attention to food trends and to maybe, uh, you know, watch some of the food shows on TV or subscribe to a magazine uh, or pay attention to cooking magazines. Um, there's a few that are listed here uh, as recommendations. Um, one thing that, that's, that you need to know when selling to restaurants is that it's, you know, the head chef is not always in charge of purchasing. Sometimes they are. Um, but finding out who's in charge of purchasing is an important thing. And so having a relationship with a chef is important, but having a relationship with that person that's actually doing the purchasing is equally important. And it actually does really pay to have multiple relationships developed at a restaurant because what happens in the restaurant industry is that chefs, chefs move around and buyers move around. And so, you know, you may... You may lose an account when a, when a person leaves a restaurant, but chances are they're going to go someplace else. And so you can just, <laughs> you know, that relationship can, can, um, can just be transferred uh, to the new, the new restaurant where those people are working. Um, a lot of chefs visit farmer's markets. If you see a person wearing a chef's coat at your farmer's market, you definitely want to introduce yourself. And this is assuming you want to want to sell uh, to, to restaurants. Um, that can be a great way to make that introduction and show off what you have. Uh, again, doing meetings in the wintertime is really important if you want to sell to restaurants. Um, there's some really some specific times that you do not want to try to reach out to restaurants during holidays, especially graduation time, uh, is a horrible time to try to reach out to a chef and introduce yourself. They're way too busy then. You'd never want to call or drop in on a chef or a buyer during meal times. Uh, you definitely need to go uh, in the morning if they have morning hours or you know, what's typically is a one to three or uh, two to four time period if you're going to drop in and try to visit with them. Um, you have to know that lots of restaurants are closed on Mondays. Um, just some basic things that you need to pay attention to. Cold calls don't generally work very well with, with, um, with buyers. Um, they really want to know you. So what I encourage people to do is try to try to do a winter meeting or, or wait until mid season and bring in a box of, of your best stuff uh, to show them what you have to offer, you know, a mixed case of the various things that you have in season right now and, and see what they're interested in. And again, you know, giving them a business card and uh, a list of all the products that you have through the year and a calendar when those products are available are, are smart tools to have with you when you go in for those, for those meetings. Um, really again, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, important to be professional, uh, making sure your stuff is impeccably clean and, uh, and packed to impress is, in, is important. Um, one thing that I learned over the years working with, with restaurants is that it's a really good idea to institute a minimum order size, or if they don't meet that minimum order to institute a delivery fee. Because you can, you know, it just doesn't pay, as, as Brett mentioned, you know, it just doesn't pay to, to deliver just a few pounds of product um, to a restaurant and, and then another few pounds to the next restaurant. Uh, having a minimum order is, is really, you know, they, they, they realize why you've got that. And as long as you've got reasonable diversity or your, your delivery fee isn't uh, out of hand, they're usually willing to comply and accept those types of, of conditions in my experience. Uh, again, we've got pros and cons here. I'm not going to spend time on these right now. Um, one, one bit of advice that I'll, I'll, I'll pause and give is that if you're going to do, if you're going to sell to restaurants or even, you know, any type of small scale wholesaling that you want to do, picking the products that you're going to do is really important. You know, if you're going to sell to chefs, Deciding to do, you know, russet potatoes and onions and iceberg lettuce is probably not the best set of products to try to to try to sell. Those are commodity crops; uh, they're not specialty crops. If you want to get a good price and get their attention, 
Uh, bring them something that's going to knock their socks off. Um, you know, baby leeks, colored carrots, mixed cases of cherry tomatoes, uh, things that are unique that are going to set you apart is uh, really um, a good way to go. Um, you know, it can be a pain to sell to restaurants. Uh, they don't always pay uh, real promptly uh, because they're struggling small businesses as well. Um, and the economy can greatly affect, re affect the restaurant market. Uh, this, you know, recession depression that we've, we, we went through um, uh, was really hard on restaurants and uh, farm selling to restaurants really noticed uh, the sales dip through that period. So, you know, there's not, there's no perfect market outlet. Uh, everything has both pros and cons. So if you're going to access wholesale markets, um, some, you know, basic things uh, to think about is how you're going to access those. And I really feel that most, but maybe the most extreme rural farms have some access. Um, just maybe just have to be willing to get in, get in a vehicle and, and make a delivery. Um, Really important to have adequate post-harvest handling facilities on your farm. You know, if you're just doing a small amount of stuff to the farmer's market, you can maybe get away with, you know, doing things in your garage or on your back porch. Uh, but if you're going to step up and, and do this, uh, you really need to have appropriate facilities for washing and packing vegetables, both so that they can be well cleaned and well chilled, and also so that they can, you know, um, uh, you do the necessary grading and packing that you're that you're going to need to do. You need to have invoicing and accounting systems set up. Um, you really should have that for any type of farm that you have. Um, having insurance is um, sometimes a requirement for some uh, working with some distributors. I work with a distributor in Chicago that requires um, a one million uh, commercial liability policy. You say one million commercial liability policy, and some people can freak out about that. Uh, those policies are not terribly, terribly expensive, and there are farmers markets that require similar levels of of insurance. And really, if you're selling fresh food to people in, in any fashion, or, uh, you should probably have insurance because you know even if you're selling to your friends and your neighbors or to your CSA members that you feel like love you to death, uh, you have to remember that it's not them that's going to come after you if there's an illness or heaven forbid a death. Um, it's their insurance company. Um, and so uh, making sure that you're insured is just smart business practice and risk management. Even though I've done primarily wholesale, I have actually never had a buyer require uh, me to be GAP or, or GIP certified. And given my level of sales, I'm going to fall under uh, the thresholds to be fully uh, compliant. Well, everybody has to be compliant with the food safety regulations behind the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, it's whether or not you're going to be inspected or not. Um, but it does really pay to uh, most, of the, most of the buyers that I work with want to know that I've done some food safety training um, and they want to know that I have a food safety plan, uh, but none to date have required that I actually be inspected and certified. My guess is that's going to change over the next several years. And so I'm preparing for it. Some, uh, some resources that I would recommend. Uh, this is a great book from uh, the organization Family Farmed out of Chicago, Wholesale Success. Great information about packing standards and post-harvest handling. Um, there's the, obviously the USDA website with grading standards. I think maybe even more important than these sources are, are what your buyers want from you. And uh, going back to what Brett was saying, that's all about communication and asking for that information. In terms of that, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Just want to point you towards a resource. Uh, this is a great organization, Farm Commons, um, that is doing all kinds of work on the legal issues around um, small-scale, diversified, direct market farming. And they've got an excellent publication, which will guide you as to in terms of whether uh, and when you're going to have to comply with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, they do lots of webinars, uh, lots of presentations, and they have lots of free uh, information on their website, farmcommons.org. Um, Brett, Christy, I am not keeping track of the time here um, because I have my screen on full 
uh, uh, full size, so I don't know where we are in terms of my 45 minutes. I'm almost to the end. Um, in terms of getting the most out of wholesale, um, you've got lots of different options. Find one that works for you and your farm. You know, maybe it's direct wholesale, maybe it's distributor wholesale, maybe it's wholesale to other farms, maybe it's wholesale to the, the, the auctions that, that Brett was talking about that are growing in Kentucky. Uh, my experience with auctions up here in Wisconsin is that the prices there are extremely low. Um, so I have, I have no interest in selling to farm auctions uh, from my small farm. I need a much higher price um, at the volumes that I'm growing. But if you're growing higher volumes, it may be uh, an option for you. Consider carefully what crops you choose to grow and sell wholesale. If you're a diversified market farm that's also doing direct marketing, uh, it can really take time to develop wholesale market streams, so you have to you know, give it a chance. And that's no different than anything else. You might start a CSA, and it may you know, be a really small enterprise for three years until you really develop a stable and larger market base. Uh, you could start selling in a brand-new farmer's market where there's not much foot traffic, and it takes you know, two or three years of, of sweat equity and maybe low profits to, to make that into a viable enterprise. Same, same can be true for wholesale. Um, one thing that I had to learn was being careful about saying yes as opportunities present themselves. When I started selling to restaurants, I was really prone to saying yes. I asked uh, buyers what they were looking for and basically whatever they said they wanted, I said yes to. And that was totally ignoring, you know, what grew well on my farm and what I liked to grow. I made some really dumb decisions. I, I knew that I'd for example, I knew I hated to grow uh, zucchini and summer squash, yet when a buyer asked me, told me that they needed a buyer for or needed a supplier for zucchini and summer squash, I said yes, because I was desperate for marketing opportunities. Um, but that was, a, it was a dumb thing to say yes to because I just absolutely hate those crops. Um, keeping records and understanding your costs are absolutely a must. Uh, I give a lot of talks about cost of production. Um, fact that I've produced a, a Veggie Compass tool, um, Veggie Compass spreadsheet was mentioned at the beginning of the talk by, by Christy and, and perhaps Brett. Um, so I spend a lot of time working with growers on this. Uh, my take is that most growers really don't know their cost of production. And so if you're making an assumption that, you know, farmers markets or CSA or wholesale is profitable, um, you need to know that you need to have the numbers to back that up. Otherwise, you're just making a guess. Um, developing efficient systems is really vital if you, as you're scaling up to do wholesale markets. Um, what I really like about wholesale markets is the opportunity to invest in some equipment. Uh, I've scaled up my carrot production so that I can, could afford a, a, a root washer, a barrel washer, uh, which has just been phenomenal in terms of efficiency of cleaning carrots on my farm. Um, most of the stuff I, I, I've said, these are just uh, kind of summary slides. Uh, I jumped down to the last one. Whether it's wholesale or direct markets, focus on quality, safety, and consistency. Um, lots of different ways to make money on a small farm. Um, choose the one that works best for you. Don't make assumptions. And uh, oh, this is my last kind of funny slide. This is the steps to profitable, satisfying farm business. If we're, if we're going to be profitable, we're not going to know that unless we start keeping records, and then we've got to keep keeping records, and then many of us have to restart keeping records because it falls apart, and we got to choose one of those and, uh, and stick with it. Otherwise, uh, we're not going to know. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'm happy to entertain some questions. I apologize if I went over time. Christy and... Uh, yeah, John. Uh, we did have one question come in. Uh, Someone is asking if you could address setting up wholesaling and marketing to corporation dining rooms and kitchens. I don't have uh, a direct experience with that, but I think that is an excellent opportunity right now. I don't know what things are like in Kentucky right now, but we have growers really starting to complain about market saturation issues up here in Wisconsin. Uh, in the Chicago market, the Madison market, the Twin Cities market. Um, these were areas where there's been tremendous growth in the number of farms. Uh, 
you know, hundreds of CSA farms, uh, farmers markets all over the place. Every community has a farmers market and multiple farmers markets and Wednesday markets, Saturday markets. And people are really starting to recognize that there is, um, you know, it's difficult to, to, to make any money there. And there's waiting lists for some of those markets and people are not filling up their, meeting their CSA member quotas. So I really feel like turning to some of these wholesale markets is, is, is an opportunity. And what the person just uh, talked about, I think is, is a real prime opportunity. Um, and there's actually an opportunity there for some tandem marketing, um, doing a, you know, doing a, a work site CSA drop site at a business, uh, can be great for people. They pick up their box on their way home from work. They don't have to make a separate trip to, to somewhere else to pick up their, their CSA box. And then a lot of these businesses have cafeterias and especially larger companies, um, are starting to have wellness programs where they're really actively encouraging their, their employees to exercise and eat healthy. And so they're wanting to have salad bars and they're wanting to buy local, they're wanting to buy organic. And so there are definite opportunities there. Um, it's a matter of, you know, having, you know, doing what I described with the chefs or the, the retail buyers going in, introducing yourself, um, having some samples. If you go in during the summertime, having sample products saying, you know, this is what I can produce. I, you know, love to supply the salad greens for your farm, for your uh, salad bar. And, um, you know, maybe you start with the, having a CSA program at that business. And so the, you know, the people uh, in that business are used to eating your product, you know, and they may be, they may actually help sell you to the the buyer uh, that's buying product for the cafeteria saying, Hey, you know, this farm's got great product. I eat it, you know, every night and on the weekends and I'd love to eat it <laughs> here in the cafeteria as well. So those are just, you know, some general comments about it and a, and a, and a strategy, you know, most of this comes down to having the guts and confidence to go in and start a conversation with a buyer. Um, and, you know, eventually that's going to come around to price. And you just have to recognize that, you know, you, you are going to have to accept a lower price selling wholesale or direct wholesale in general. That's true. And you have to run the numbers and, and figure out whether, okay, well, you know, I'm selling the salad mix in bulk cases and I'm not having to bag it up individually for my CSA members. So I've got less labor there and I can sell larger volume. And because I can sell larger volume, I can afford this piece of machinery that's going to help me spin the greens dry or, you know, whatever it is uh, and run those numbers and, and make sure that it works for you. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Feel free to type those into the Q&A panel. Uh, if, if you are coming up with questions, I will go ahead and put in the chat panel uh, a link to a survey. If you could possibly take uh, just a few minutes to complete this for us, uh, it will really help us with future programming. Looks like we did get another question in. Uh, just, oh, sorry. It's thanks for the feedback, John. So uh, You're welcome. Thank you, Christy, for posting the VeggieCompass.com website link there in the chat box. You're very welcome. A wonderful tool. And uh, if, if you aren't familiar with Veggie Compass, I highly recommend that you check that out because there's just uh, it's just a wonderful tool that uh, it will take some time to get used to it, but uh, it's great information and it will really pay off in the long run. Uh, Brett has posted a slide with contact information for all three of us. Uh, just want to make sure you're able to, to reach us if you need to. I'd like to thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much to both Brett and John. Uh, we really appreciate John and his willingness to, to help us out with this webinar. And um, we hope that you will definitely check out our website. That's www.uky.edu slash ccd. Uh, we do have a lot of resources, and including those crop budgets and our crop profiles and marketing profiles that I think you'll find to be useful. 
and be sure to check out, uh, I've also posted in the chat the link to where our What to Think About Before You Plant resources are located, and that will include the recording of today's webinar, which should be online uh, by tomorrow. So uh, thanks again, everyone. And if you could take a couple of minutes to, to complete that survey for us, we would really appreciate it. Thanks again to John. And uh, check out our website and check out Veggie Compass. And John, you had mentioned that uh, there will be sometime in the future uh, another similar tool for fruit and nut crops, I think. Uh, Actually, we have a we have a livestock comp compass in the works, uh -huh. as well as a fruit and nut compass. Uh, the fruit and nut compass okay. we just received grant funding, for, so it's a ways away. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's something to look forward to down the road. So, yep. all right. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, uh, I think that will be it. Thanks again for joining us and. Uh, be sure to check out our website for information about future webinars and the recording of today's webinar. And, um, you know, wish you all the best in your farming endeavors. Thanks so much.